This question is getting at very particular facts that you learn in one of the sections uh, about the. Uh, oh. <laughs> I guess okay uses multiple sections. Um, one of the uh, things that. Uh, Relevant is okay. So we are still so at least for the purpose of this question, we are only dealing with the monatomic gases. So we don't have to worry so much about the equipartition theorem. Um, so I guess uh, let me go to the section and um, uh, look at the key thing that you should uh, have memorized. Uh, or having it memorized will help you both uh, with this question and later on um, as we do heat engine cycle analysis you are going to be appealing to this effect quite often so it's good to have it um, thoroughly um, uh, thoroughly um, um, internalized and uh, what it is is let's see here I think so um, let me use this portion here so this was derived more carefully in a previous section this is actually one of the key things that come out of the kinetic theory of gas that the translational kinetic or average translational kinetic energy of a particle one half mv squared averaged is equal to three halves Boltzmann constant times temperature in absolute scale. And um, that's really the key thing that you should remember. And that's the thing that you'll be appealing to when you are analyzing heat engine cycles. It comes down to when you are looking at the internal energy of a gas particle. And if you are considering uh, internal energy per particle, then that internal energy per particle is equal to this is where you do have to be a little bit careful right now i'm going to write down three halves kbt so if you are talking about internal energy of the portal system then you would have to take this and multiply it by number of particles and the Part you have to be careful is that the, uh, what I'm expressing here, this is 3 halves kBT, this only addresses the translational kinetic energy. Uh, for monatomic gases, like what we are dealing with in this question, that's fine. That We are all good. We have no other uh, buckets of energy to worry about. But um, when you have more complicated gas particles, diatomic gas or uh, even more parts to it, then we will have to start to worry about rotational kinetic energy and potentially uh, vibrational kinetic energy. And um, that's what the textbook section 2.3 is addressing, that with the diatomic uh, gas that you have um, these additional degrees of freedom that get involved. This is when rotational degree becomes important, and this is when the vibrational degree becomes unfrozen. For the purpose of this question, um, we don't have to worry about it, so we won't. But I want you to highlight that because um, when I was first teaching physics 4B, that's actually the mistake that I kept making. I was just uh, from the start always saying, oh, my internal energy is just the three halves NKBT. And um, later on, when we have um, gases that are not monatomic, then we can just automatically say that. When we have a diatomic gas, we have to use five halves NKBT. So, so with that, um, now the rest is just uh, working through this uh, expression. And I guess uh, one thing that's gonna turn out to be useful to have on hand is that this uh, quantity here, it represents the uh, translational kinetic energy or one half m v squared averaged um, so okay so the question says that these two are at the same temperature 
Good. And answer the question below if uh, um, some gas of mass uh, mass M A has. So this is the 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 mass of the gas particle, not necessarily the total collection of gas. Uh, or actually, no, sorry, this is the total collection of gas. I gotta be careful in labeling this then. Um, all right, so I'll just uh, note that. If some amount of gas uh, A has the same total internal energy as 0 0.7 gram of gas B. Okay, um, what is the ratio of the number of molecules of gas A and gas B? Oh, yeah. So if you are feeling like um, you might not have enough information because, you know, these gases have different masses and all that. Um, what I hope you will realize is that as far as the internal energy goes, um, if you look at this expression, none of this depends at all on uh, masses of the uh, masses of the gas particles. So it. So, you know, in the question statement, they are not telling you if it is the differences in the differences in the gas masses are uh, either due to differences in the molecular mass or differences in the just total number. But you don't have to worry about that because in this expression for the internal energy, really all you have to check off are what's the total number of gas molecules and what is the temperature, or flip that around, what is the average energy per molecule given here, and what is the total number. And in this question, they told you that they have the same temperature, and that without having to know anything more about these gases, other than that they are both monatomic, um, you already know the average energy per gas molecule. Uh, this, is, uh, this uh, expression is valid, um, whether so this uh, expression is something you can rely on without having to know mass or velocity of the gas particles so so you have that you have that they have the same average uh, internal energy per particle so the moment that they tell you that they have the same total internal energy must mean that they have the same number of particles so ratio here is one um, so this uh, difference in the masses of the gas must come from their uh, molecular mass difference. Uh, it's uh, in, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, what is the ratio of the atomic mass of gas A and gas B? Well, if the same number of molecules lead to these two, then uh, MA, meaning the mass of a single molecule of gas A, must be, uh, you know, 9.5 over 0 0.7 times the mass of the single molecule of gas B. And you can really only say this portion after having figured out this portion. Okay. Um, and part C, what is the ratio of the RMS speeds of gas A and gas B? And um, this, I think a hint was maybe a little bit tricky because a hint links you to, oh, maybe not. You know, you know, hint wasn't tricky. It never linked you to section 2.4. If it did, it would have been tricky because, um, you know, talking about the velocities and whatnot, uh, one prep I was falling into is, hey, do I have to know the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution? And, and you don't have to because, um, because it's not asking about some detailed thing about the, um, the velocity distribution. It's really only asking for the RMS speeds. And you know this quantity here, the V squared average, this is already, um, this is already, um, let's see. So you are not, you, um, this is already V and S. As in, you took the velocity, you squared it, and then you took the mean, you took the average. So to get the, um, to get the R MS velocity, 
really all you have to do is take the square root of that quantity, v squared averaged. And because you have this relationship that one half m oh, v m s, or sorry, this is confusing me because there's a square that's not showing up, v squared averaged, uh, because this is equal to three halves kBT. And we already have from the other information given in this question that the right hand side is the same for gases A and B. Uh, we can figure out, oh, so the left hand side is also the same for gases A and B. And given that their masses are different, the only way this combination can turn out to be the same is if uh, uh, this ratio is the reciprocal of this ratio here. So, uh, so the answer here should be 0 0.7 over 9.5. And Oh, and I can plug in all the numbers. So this is one. <laughs> Let me just plug in these other numbers as well. Uh, that I need to calculate. 9.5 over 0 0.7. 13.6. And the other ratio, um, 0 0.7 over 9.5, oops, uh, 0 0.0737. So, yeah, that should be it. Oh, wait, what did I miss? Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so the ratio, um, this is squared is the reciprocal of that. So for here, I need to take the uh, reciprocal and then take the square root to account for this uh, root portion. So forgot about that. So take the square root here, okay. 0 0.271 is what it should be. So yeah. And it, so I guess um, given our emphasis on heat engine cycles, we don't really get to spend a lot of time talking about the kinetic theory of gas. But from my perspective, really, that's one of the um, significant physics achievements in thermal physics. That, um, that, and, 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 you know, this question is getting at those details of the kinetic theory of gas. And um, it's... Uh, the whole kinetic theory of gas illustrates the um, difference between physics and our very closely related cousin, chemistry. In chemistry, ideal gas law is a phenomenological law. People stumbled upon their law doing experiments, which is good. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, in physics, our uh, you know we call our call it fundamental science because the approach that is really valued in physics is the, being able to derive everything from fundamental first principles. And in kinetic theory of gas, we really don't bring in any other assumption other than that you have a big sample of um, many um, bouncing balls that you can treat them statistically. And from that, you drive the ideal gas law. And in addition, you drive this expression here that kind of um, falls out in comparing what you get in kinetic theory with the ideal gas law.